Thanks very much for inviting me to be here today. It's a real honor. So today I wanted to uh, talk about a bit, something a bit different, and that's uh, the microbiome and cancer immunotherapy. Now, we've certainly made tremendous advances in the treatment of cancer through the use of both targeted therapy as well as immunotherapy, and specifically immune checkpoint blockade. And you can see from these, these are something called waterfall plots, where uh, the bars that go down mean that these tumors are shrinking within these patients. And so we see that a, a large number of patients actually benefit from these therapies. But we also know that responses to these therapies aren't universal, and there's still a critical need to identify better predictors of response as well as resistance mechanisms that could potentially be targeted. So I've been focusing on this with my group for uh, about a decade now, and we really have focused on how we can better understand responses to therapy and to optimize different treatment regimens. And so as a group, what we've done is uh, we've used a very powerful way of looking at this, and, and that's via something called reverse translation, where we basically take findings from bedside to bench and then go back again. And this is an illustration showing just that, where we take insights uh, from patients having longitudinal tumor and blood uh, uh, biopsies during the course of therapy, use those samples to gain mechanistic insight, take them to mouse models for optimization, and then bring it back to the patients. And so with regard to cancer immunotherapy, we know that responses to treatment are actually dependent on a number of different factors that shape both tumor growth and immunity. And certainly with the, ne uh, with the advent of next-gen sequencing, we know that the tumor genome and epigenome are very important. We know that the tumor microenvironment is also critically important. And certainly in the setting of immunotherapy, the immune system and systemic immunity play a major role. But what is becoming very apparent now is that environmental factors uh, actually play quite a significant role in the response to cancer therapy, and namely, I'll talk and highlight the microbiome. And so what is the microbiome? Well, we know that within our bodies, there are over 100 trillion microbes uh, that coexist with us. They actually outnumber our own normal human cells by up to 10 to 1, and the largest proportion of these reside in the gut. And we know that disturbances of the gut microbiome, something called dysbiosis, are implicated in a large number of diseases, ranging from asthma, inflammatory bowel disease, heart disease, depression, even obesity. And I pose the question now is that could the microbiome actually become the newest frontier in precision medicine with diagnostic and therapeutic strategies that actually target the microbiome? And so there's certainly strong evidence that bacteria in the gut can influence responses to cancer therapy, and this is particularly true for cancer immunotherapy. And so we learned a lot of this from uh, investigators in stem cell transplant, where years ago, uh, investigators from Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, both Eric Pamer and Marcel Vandenbrink, looked at a group of patients who were actually getting a stem cell, tra stem cell transplant for AML, and they uh, looked at the gut microbiome of those patients, actually took fecal samples, sequenced those samples. And what they found when they did that is that they found that patients who had a more diverse gut microbiome actually did significantly better in the setting of stem cell transplant. In addition to this, we know that the composition matters within the gut microbiome. And this was pioneering work done by Laurent Zipvogel in France and Tom Gajewski at the University of Chicago, where they showed in preclinical models in mice that depending on what the composition of the gut microbiome looked like, they either responded or failed to respond to checkpoint blockade. And actually, you could actually change the microbiome and make the mice respond better. And so we were inspired by these findings, and we wanted to better understand the role of the gut microbiome in response to checkpoint blockade. And we studied this in a, a patients with metastatic melanoma. And so I just wanted to show you the schema on how we studied this. I had actually seen uh, Tom Gajewski's data presented at the Society for the Immunotherapy of Cancer meeting in 2014 and was just floored by uh, his presentation and got up to the mic after the session and asked, you know, have you actually studied this in patients? They had not, and so saw that as an opportunity. Ran back home to Texas and uh, signed up patients onto a protocol where we uh, would actually take an initial oral and gut microbiome sample 
do a tumor biopsy when feasible on these patients, and these were all patients with metastatic melanoma who were going on to systemic therapy. We would then start the therapy, they would be restaged, and we would repeat the oral and gut microbiome sample. And this is uh, our schema. Now you can see the cohort, in a year and a half we, have, we got samples from over 200 patients, we now have samples from over 500 patients uh, that have been treated with systemic therapy. And you can see the breakdown of treatment in melanoma, a mainstay of treatment now is cancer immunotherapy, specifically checkpoint blockade, and you can see that the vast majority of those patients were treated with checkpoint blockade. And in fact, uh, the largest proportion of these patients were treated with anti-PD-1, and so we studied that group first. And so what we did with these samples is on all the microbiome samples, we did 16S sequencing on all, with uh, metagenomic sequencing on a subset. We also profiled the tumors by whole exome sequencing and profiled both blood and tumors uh, for immune profiling. Now, the first question we asked, and this was going back to the stem cell transplant literature, was, is there an association between the diversity of the gut microbiome and response to cancer immunotherapy in patients with melanoma? And so what we did is we took our patients who had metastatic melanoma and were going on to anti-PD-1 therapy. We then, uh, they had undergone treatment, we dichotomized them into either responders or non-responders, with responders either having a complete response, a partial response, or at least stable, stable disease for at least six months, whereas non-responders had progressed on therapy. We then looked at the diversity of the gut microbiome after doing the sequencing, and what we found was quite striking, namely that patients, just like the stem cell transplant literature, patients who have a higher diversity of their gut microbiome, which is generally associated with better gut health, had a much better outcome. In addition to that, we also did what the investigators at Memorial had done and broke this down into tertiles of diversity. And what we found is that patients, again, who had a high diversity of, bac of bacteria in the gut microbiome actually had a significantly prolonged progression-free survival. So diversity matters, how about composition, just as in the preclinical models? And so we next asked the question, is there an association between the composition of the microbiome and response to anti-PD-1 in these patients? And so again, turn towards the same cohort, this time looking at composition rather than diversity. And what we found uh, via several different approaches is composition also matters. Now what we did is this is, uh, we looked at this in a couple different ways. This is an enrichment index with non-zero abundance of bacteria with each column representing a patient and each row representing a bacterial taxa or OTU. And when we plotted it this way, you can see the responders are in the blue, the uh, non-responders in the green. What we found when we looked at the composition of the gut microbiome was that there were essentially three sets of bacteria. There was a set that was enriched in responders. There was a set that was pretty much equivalent in both. And then there was a set of bacteria that was enriched in non-responders within the gut microbiome. And at the 30,000 foot view, what we found is that responders tended to have a higher abundance of clostridiales and non-responders had a higher abundance of bacteroidales. We validated this approach using a technique by Curtis Huttenhauer uh, uh, called LEFC and found reassuringly the same exact bacteria popping up. Namely, responders had a higher abundance of Fecalibacter ruminococcus clostridiales, whereas non-responders had a higher abundance of Bacteroidales. So again, diversity matters, composition matters. And we didn't see any differences in the oral microbiome. So we did metagenomic sequencing, basically validated all of these findings. We also uh, plotted the top two bacteria, Fecalibacteria in the responders, Bacteroidales in the non-responders, and then dichotomized patients into having either a high versus a low abundance of those. And we found that if they had a high abundance of Fecalibacteria, they did well and had a prolonged PFS, whereas if they had a low abundance of Bacteroidales, they did, kind of validating our prior findings. And so we next asked the question, what is the relationship of these gut bacteria, what's going on in the tumor microenvironment? And so we looked at the tumors in, uh, that were available, that were sampled, and what we found is no surprise that patients who responded to therapy tended to have more T cells in the tumor at baseline. But when we asked the question, what's the relationship of these T cells to the gut microbiome, what we did is we plotted the abundance of specific bacteria within the gut microbiome uh, opposed to the markers of T cell cytotoxicity within the tumor microenvironment, we basically found that if patients had a favorable microbiome with more Clostridiales, Fecalibacteria, and Ruminococcus, they had more cytolytic T cells within the tumor microenvironment, whereas if they had more Bacteroidales, they had a lower abundance. And so these were highly correlated. We found the same exact thing in the blood. So depending on the gut microbiome, you can actually find more 
Uh, if, if patients have a good microbiome, they have more effector CD8 cells, you know, like these CAR T type cells. Whereas if they have an unfavorable microbiome, they have more regulatory T cells. And so we then, uh, we, of course, a key question is what's the mechanism through which this gut microbiome can actually enhance responses to checkpoint blockade? And we know that uh, patients or mice, actually, that had a good m gut microbiome had more antigen-presenting cells within the tumor, and we found the same exact thing in our patients. We also know that metabolites are critically important, and we, we did metabolomic profiling or inferred metabolomics based on our whole genome shotgun sequencing and found uh, differential metabolomic signatures. So we did do mechanistic studies as well, where we actually took fecal samples from either patients who responded or failed to respond to checkpoint blockade, and then put these into germ-free mice. We looked at systemic immune responses in those mice, and they were completely different, and then we implanted melanoma tumors. And what we found is if mice got a fecal transplant from a responding patient, they either flat-out rejected the tumors, or the tumors grew quite slowly, and they also responded well to checkpoint blockade. Whereas if they got a fecal transplant from a non-responding patient, the tumors grew rapidly and failed to respond. And the mice who had a FMT from a responder had a dense T-cell infiltrate, again suggesting there's a real link here. And also the gut was more infiltrated with T-cells, suggesting that this actually may act as a reservoir. So other groups have made similar observations. Again, Tom Gajewski studied this in, and Laurent studied this in mice. They now studied this in patients and saw very similar things with findings published in Science in January. So, so the, a key question, though, is you know, can we actually modulate the microbiome to enhance responses to therapy? And I'm an eternal optimist, and I can tell you the answer is absolutely yes. It's not going to be simple, though, and I think uh, we definitely need to work together to get there. And we're working with the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, as well as a company based out of uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, called Ceres, to implement a clinical trial to actually test the hypothesis that if you, can, if you change the microbiome, you can actually make responses better. And so just before lunch, I'm going to send you off with some advice here. We, uh, in our cohort, we also studied the influence of diet and lifestyle factors, uh, such as stress and depression on the microbiome and response. Diet, I'll give you a little clue here. And what we did is we actually, in every single patient who came in, we administered this lifestyle questionnaire, and then we looked at a couple factors. One is we looked at fiber intake, and we found that patients who had a high fiber diet had a higher diversity in their gut microbiome and more of the good bacteria, so go out there and eat your fiber at lunchtime. Interestingly, get this, up to 30% of our patients actually admit to taking probiotics. Now, one would think maybe probiotics make it better. They actually make the microbiome worse, at least the probiotics that these patients were taking, which is provocative because there are a lot of people, not only cancer patients, out there taking probiotics. And so, Big data, my big data slide. <laughs> like Crystal, I'm not as much into the, you know, personally into the big data, but I, I love what you're doing with it. But I think the microbiome has relevance across the health continuum. You know, it's interesting when we actually, we are now screening donors for our trial, and when we uh, have done sequencing of complete responders, we find that some have a very good microbiome, others don't. Interestingly, we also screened healthy donors, and we find that some have a very good microbiome, and actually some have a microbiome that looks quite like a non-responder. So what is healthy, what is normal, I think is an important question, but we have a lot to learn from, from everyone here within the microbiome space. But I think as we integrate this data, we'll really be able to enter full force into the era of precision medicine. So with that, uh, we've done all of this in the context of the Melanoma Moonshot Program at MD Anderson, but I always say that the, uh, these efforts are going on worldwide, certainly here at Stanford, and the strongest gains are made through collaboration. So with that, I will end, and I believe we'll do our panel. Thank you.